Hello everyone and welcome to CRAMSurge, clinical research appraisal and methodology for surgical trainees, where we pick a paper fresh from the press on a hot general surgical topic. We review it for you, we present it for you, we critique its methodology for you and provide top of the field expert opinions and teaching on research appraisal and methodology. My name is Gio Perrin and together with Professor Sababella Subramanian, Adam Haig, Ben Wood and Josh Lau, we bring you Crown Surge from the wonderful region of the Yorkshire and the Humber. Yes. Lovely. Right, so we discussed um, a little bit about diagnostic tests uh, last time and these are the points we touched upon. So for each of these diagnostic tests that we do in our clinical practice, there are lots of different parameters that we can use to assess how useful these tests are. We talked about sensitivity and specificity, which includes accuracy as well. We talked about predictive values, positive and negative predictive values, and we talked about likelihood ratios, likelihood ratio of a positive test and likelihood ratio of a negative test. Right, so we then uh, discussed that sensitivity and specificity have a really important role in research and can be used in comparing different diagnostic tests. So you can compare the sensitivities and specificities of different tests, like maybe the use of CRP and uh, white cell count in the diagnosis of, diagnosis of appendicitis, for example. But just the values, the sensitivity value and the specificity value uh, is of little use in clinical practice. Yeah, so we discussed an example and we looked at why sensitivity and specificity are not directly useful for the average clinician. We then talked about predictive values and I emphasize that predictive values have a really important role in screening and we're going to talk about that again. And we said that likelihood ratios, the likelihood ratio for positive test particularly, um, is really useful in estimating post-test probabilities and that's why likelihood ratios are of value in clinical practice, right? So um, if you wanted to uh, look back at these slides, they, then they're there on the YouTube, they're there on the website, so you know, feel free to have uh, a look again. I thought we should um, cover two other aspects before we conclude the chapter on diagnostic and screening test. One is the rock curve, and it fits in nicely with the paper we've discussed today. And the other is the issues in relation to screening tests. So let's look at the rock curve first. Now, if you have a straightforward uh, diagnostic test, and by straightforward, I mean a test that will give you um, a yes or no answer, then um, it becomes very easy to use that test in clinical practice. It, is, it becomes very easy to assess the usefulness of the test. So if you have uh, an ultrasound that you're doing for right eye for the pain and the sonologist or the radiologist tells you it is appendicitis or it isn't, then you've got a binary yes or no answer from that diagnostic test. And therefore, uh, you can go ahead with the next step in your management pathway. If you do a biopsy on a lump in the lung that uh, and you're looking for cancer, then you're expecting the biopsy to be either positive or negative, and then you use the positive or negative result to move forward. What if the test is quantitative? What if the test is uh, a number on a scale? Let's consider an example. Let's say there's a new interleukin, and uh, not necessarily six, but something called interleukin X, that you're researching and you're looking at the value of that interleukin in, in the serum in acute appendicitis and let's say the values seem to range from 1 to 100 picograms per ml and let's say you've done a study in appendicitis patients and, and, and in controls and you find that the this particular interleukin x is higher in appendicitis patients compared to controls. So you've got a mean value of 17 appendicitis and you've got a mean value of 55 in controls. And then you've got this um, dilemma as to what level, what threshold do I use to, um, to say beyond this level you've got appendicitis or below this level you haven't got appendicitis. So in, in these kinds of questions, plotting this ROC curve, receiver operating characteristic curve, uh, can help you uh, calculate the sensitivity and specificity or one minus specificity and I'll explain that in a minute 
for each value of this particular um, interleukin. I've got it as peptide here, but, but that, that uh, let's say, is interleukin for the diagnosis of appendicitis. Okay, so uh, here's a, a, an example of a rock curve. We've looked at this in this paper just a few minutes ago. So essentially, in a rock curve, what you do is you plot the true positive on the y-axis, a true positive is the same as a sens sensitivity. If you think about it, go back to the uh, formula for sensitivity, you'll realize that sensitivity is the same as true positive. And then on the x-axis, you plot the specificity or the inverse of specificity, one minus specificity, which is simply the false positive rate. So if you take, um, let's consider this blue line, and let's consider that the blue line represents the value of this new interleukin, and you're looking at it um, uh, as potential in the diagnosis of appendicitis. What you're saying is, as your sensitivity goes up, for any test, the specificity is going to go down. Or, in other words, the one minus specificity is going to go up. So what you say is because you do not know what value of interleukin X is going to be useful, for every value, you plot the sensitivity over one minus specificity. So, um, and then you get a curve, and that is what is called the ROC curve or the, R or the ROC curve. Now, in an ideal test, you will find that you, uh, the curve uh, takes the shape of a very a straight line going right up and then uh, cutting across and moving towards the um, upper right corner of the screen. In other words, a test that is useless or of little value will fall along this, di um, this diagonal, right? A test that is of little value will fall along the diagonal. So the higher or the further away the curve is from the di uh, diagonal, the more useful the test is going to be. So if you wanted um, a really perfect test, then you will hope that um, you will that the curve will be well away from the diagonal following my laser pointer. And then you will be able to choose a point on the curve that gives you maximum sensitivity and maximum specificity or the lowest one minus specificity on the x-axis and it is furthest away from the diagonal. In other words, the area under that curve will be as high as you can get. So you're looking at the area under the curve, which is uh, the area uh, or the area of the graph that's between the curve and the diagonal. You're looking to see how far away from the diagonal the curve is. And, uh, um, and then you're going to decide on the point furthest away from the diagonal in choosing your cutoff. So that is one very important use of the rock curve. Another use of the rock curve, as has been described and discussed in the paper, is when you're comparing two, three, or four different uh, diagnostic scores, if you like, and you want to look at the area under the curve for each of these diagnostic tests. And typically, you would choose the test that's got the maximum area under the curve. So that's another useful um, value of using rock curves, um, i.e. you compare different diagnostic tests, which um, effectively are quantitative measures of whatever you want to predict, and you look at the area under the curve. Okay, so hopefully that, that um, um, gives you some insight into what ROC curves are. Right, Let, let's then move on to screening tests. So we talked a lot about diagnostic tests, and I thought we should conclude the lecture on diagnostic tests by talking a little bit about screening tests. The screening tests effectively are like diagnostic tests. You're looking to see how you can improve the prediction of a particular problem or a disease that you're interested in. The only difference between the diagnostic and screening tests are that screening tests are done in a population that are healthy or do not manifest signs and symptoms of disease. So you do screening tests to hopefully try and prevent disease or you want to de uh, detect disease early. It could be population screening where you're not really stratifying the people you're screening in terms of their risk of having the disease. 
uh, or you could be doing opportunistic screening or screening in high risk settings. So examples in surgery would be screening for malignancies like breast cancer and bowel cancer, maybe screening for aortic aneurysm in otherwise asymptomatic people who may be at risk. And also, you're all very familiar with the screening for um, MRSA. You, you do a swab, MRSA swab as a preoperative screening tool. So these are some examples of screening tests. And that's why I think we should be understanding the limitations of screening tests, at least the general principles um, of, of um, the, uh, the pitfalls of using screening tests. Right. So when we talk of screening, you've got to take a step back and uh, have a think about what would be an ideal screening test. It really depends partly on what you're screening for as well, but the World Health Organization laid down a series of principles um, where, where they outlined what would be an ideal screening test, and they were talking about this in the context of infectious diseases and also of cancer, right? So essentially what they say is you've got to be screening for an important health problem, obviously, a lot of these are fairly logical and, and obvious statements, but it's useful to keep them in mind. And they say that you've got to have a simple, safe, precise, and validated test. They say that the treatment of early stage disease, this is in the context of cancer, sometimes, and also infectious disease, should provide benefit, reduce morbidity, mortality, and outweigh harm. In other words, um, there should be some benefit in screening early, and you might think this is a pretty um, commonsensical thing to say, but you'll be surprised how many times um, in science and research we embark on screening without necessarily having a really optimum strategy to, uh, uh, to implement when you screen for something early. A typical example would be uh, this discussion about screening for Alzheimer's and dementia and so on, and um, when uh, we may not necessarily have effective uh, treatments to institute at an early stage of the disease, so you might uh, you might just wonder, you know, what's the point in screening and inducing anxiety when you do not have anything to change the natural history of the disease. Obviously, screening should be cost effective and you need to be able to demonstrate these days that the um, that the intervention would then be of some benefit in improving quality of life and improving survival. And um, it should be beneficial in terms of cost per quality, quality, quality referring to quality adjusted life here. If it's a very expensive uh, test, which does not give you enough life years, then obviously many societies will not be able to afford them. And if you're introducing a screening program in your practice or in your region, then obviously there needs to be a plan for audit and standards. And patients should be fully informed not just of the benefits of screening, but also the risks of screening. Okay, so the key um, things to remember is that screening tests are associated with a number of significant limitations and often we tend to overlook these uh, limitations and focus primarily on the benefits. Now I won't sp spend any time on the benefits because uh, they, they, they are self-explanatory but I'll just go through a couple of slides on limitations. Now there are two important limitations you need to think about. One is called the lead time bias and the other is called the length time or the overdiagnosis bias, right? So any screening test will obviously end up in increasing the incidence of the problem because you're probably detecting the disease early and you might be detecting a disease in many instances which may not manifest um, in the course of the individual's lifetime, okay? So we'll come to lead time and length time bias in a minute. The other things to consider are the psychological impact of false positive test results. This is particularly important in the context of um, cancer screening. There's also morbidity of treatment and costs of treatment. And when you look at screening tests in cancer, if you look at the literature, you will find that often the discussion is about reduction in cancer specific mortality. And people don't talk much about whether there is an impact on overall or all cause mortality in cancer. So if you look at uh, the trials of screening in bowel cancer and colorectal and uh, breast cancer, you will find that the literature is full of how the 
screening intervention reduces colorectal cancer specific death and breast cancer specific death, but they keep a bit quiet about overall mortality. And you might think that if you reduce uh, cancer specific death, then inevitably you will reduce overall mortality. But if you think about it, that may not necessarily be the case. It may be, it may not be that you're really reducing overall mortality because you might be picking um, uh, diseases in an elderly population where there are competing risks to mortality. There might be lots of other things that might uh, uh, influence mortality. All right, let's talk about length, elite time bias. You've probably heard of this uh, in the context of screening, but uh, here is uh, an explanation. So let's assume that you have um, a, a person has cancer, say, at the age of 50 and becomes symptomatic of cancer at the age of 50 and then goes to the GP and gets diagnosed and treated in secondary care and they succumb to the cancer at the age of 60. So they've lived for 10 years following detection, diagnosis and treatment of that cancer. Let's suppose the same individual was um, in a screening program for that specific cancer, and the cancer was detected on screening at the age of 45, so five years before they would have otherwise detected it um, by virtue of having symptoms. And let's say you didn't start treatment, or there's no specific treatment for the early diagnosis, and you simply started treatment at 50, and they still died at 60. Now, that particular patient who was screen detected would have lived, lived for 15 years, whereas if they had symptomatic detection, they would have lived for only 10 years. So you can see that even without any specific or beneficial intervention for a screen detected cancer, just by treating them in the usual way, i.e. when they got symptoms, you spuriously are increasing their life um, expectancy or survival after diagnosis by an extra five years without really having offered them any treatment. So this is what is called lead time bias. And this is a fallacy seen in so many observational screening studies that observational screening studies are now considered um, completely worthless because you know, they do not take into account the fact that you know, lead time bias could have um, influenced their results systematically. And that's why it's important that randomized control trials are done for screening. And even in randomized control trials, sometimes over analysis of the results um, can, uh, can, uh, can be influenced by lead time bias. Okay, so I hope that makes sense. The next is the bias of overdiagnosis, or some people call it um, length time bias. And I'll explain this um, with this figure. So let's assume that um, on the x-axis of this graph, you have time, and on the y-axis, you have extent of disease. And let's assume that if you're talking about a specific disease where, uh, which progresses over time, and some people die of the disease. So the first group of patients here, um, over time, succumb to the disease. And then you've got another group of patients where maybe the disease is a bit more indolent, and uh, you have some patients dying of the disease, but other patients dying of natural causes, i.e. of causes unrelated to the disease, or what we would say competing causes of death. And then you've got a third group of patients who don't really succumb to the disease, but then end up dying of maybe a chest infection or a myocardial infarction or a road traffic accident and what have you, right? So um, let's say that you are in a situation in a setting where uh, you're only diagnosing the disease after it becomes clinically obvious, i.e. when they get symptoms. So in that cohort, you will, um, uh, you, you're likely to see that a lot of pe people are going to die from the disease, and only a few people will die of natural causes. Now let's say for this particular disease, or so cancer, you implement a screening intervention, and then you're picking up the disease much early in the natural history. So this is the cohort. And you will see that a lot more patients uh, that you pick up from this screen detected intervention, you're going to pick up really early. And uh, you will find that um, they are going to be, a lot more people are going to be dying of natural causes because you're de detecting them early and, uh, and you may be subjecting them to treatment. But again, there are these competing interests 
or competing diseases that would influence their mortality. Now, if you detect uh, patients even early by introducing another more effective, what you think is a very efficacious screening test, what you're doing is you're going to be picking up loads and loads of patients who are going to be dying of natural causes. So picking up disease or detecting disease, um, either by doing excessive um, scanning, like CT scans and MRI and so on, and PET scans that we, that we tend to do all too often these days, or by implementing a screening test, will result in the diagnosis of disease that, that may never become manifest in the course of the individual's lifetime. So that's a problem, that's the overdiagnosis bias or length time bias, which is a huge problem in um, screening tests. Okay, so take home points. So we've uh, learned before in the previous um, lecture that predictive values are what are really important for screening tests and likelihood ratios are important for diagnostic tests, right? In the first lecture, we also emphasized how understanding pretest probability is really important to be able to use diagnostic test results effectively. If you do not know pretest probability, then you're not going to be um, in a position to use the results of the diagnostic test to, to the benefit of your patients. Um, we talked about rock curves in this lecture, and, and I hope you remember that rock curves are useful for either comparing tests or for deciding what thresholds or cutoffs to use in a test that, is, that gives you a quantitative result, not a yes or no answer. And then we talked about screening briefly, and um, I explained what lead time bias means and what overdiagnosis bias means. Thank you everyone for tuning in and listening. Until next time, keep running your life with our surgical podcast.